The B-58 was probably one of the most specialized bombers in the U.S. has ever built. In the early years of the new atomic war strategy, the B-36 was a primary long-range nuclear strike bomber. But with the introduction of the MiG-15, the B-36 was immediately rendered obsolete. It was much too slow to be of use in a new jet edge. The United States wanted a supersonic, high-flying bomber that could run away from Soviet interceptors and fly higher than any plane the Soviets had. The B-47 served this role for a time, but more altitude and speed was needed. Plus, the B-47 had its own issues with airframe reliability due to the Air Force still trying to iron out the maintenance schedules for jet planes, which had a much higher rate of metal fatigue than the piston engine planes of the past. The B-52 had taken on the role of the United States' primary heavy bomber by the late 1950s, but a fast, quick strike penetration bomber was still needed to fill the intermediate role. The Air Force issued its requirements to multiple manufacturers, including Boeing and Convair, and ultimately after phase one of testing the prototypes, the Convair design got the nod. The resulting aircraft was the United States' first true supersonic bomber program. A Delta wing bomber with a 60 degree wing sweep and four General Electric J-79 jet engines located under its wings and pods. The plane had three separate crewmen seated in three separate pod-style cockpits located tandemly down the fuel slide of the aircraft. Each crew member's cockpit had an ejection pod, which is essentially a fully enclosed mini space capsule that could allow ejection up to 70,000 feet and up to Mach 2 speeds. During testing, the ejection system was tested using live bears and chimps, which would probably not be something they would be allowed to do today. Another first for the B-58 design was the use of honeycomb skin. It was a revolutionary new technology at the time which used aluminum and fiberglass sandwiched together in a honeycomb design which provided lightweight and extreme rigidity. Due to the fact that friction with the air at high speeds created an immense amount of heat, the landing gear and all the avionics systems of the plane were housed inside the plane and had their own fully air conditioned and pressurization systems. The cockpit and control and warning systems for the plane were very advanced for the day, even using a tape recorded system to play voice warnings over the headset radios for different issues. They even researched young men to see if they could pay more attention to a male or female voice in distracted or high stress situations. They found a female voice was much more effective to gain a pilot's attention, and actress Joan Elms was used to record the voice recordings for the system and would be known uh, to B-58 pilots as Sexy Sally. <laughs> yeah, that was before the Me Too era. Due to the plane being a delta wing style design, the flying characteristics of the plane were much different than conventional plane designs, especially at low speed flight and landings. So to get pilots used to flying the design, F-102 Delta Daggers were used in a training system as conversion trainers. The plane had extremely high performance as a bomber. A fully loaded plane could weigh over 176,000 pounds but still climb to almost 40,000 feet in around one minute. The range of the plane without air-to-air -air refueling was 4,400 nautical miles and its maximum speed was around 1,325 miles per hour. Its ceiling was around 65,000 feet. This high performance of the plane led it to set 19 world altitude and speed records, but it also led it to being a relatively dangerous plane to fly. By the time it was retired from service, about 25% of the entire fleet of 116 planes had actually crashed, even though the plane never dropped a single bomb in anger during its brief 10-year service span. That's pretty crazy to think about. I mean, you got a quarter of your planes crashing and they've never even seen combat. The weapon system for the Hustler was probably the most advanced weapon system and navigation system ever designed up until that point in time. It featured a KS-39 Star Tracker to provide heading reference, Doppler radar to provide altitude and wind speed data, a search radar system to provide range and other data for bomb release times. This system had on average 10 times better accuracy than any previous system employed by any other bomber in history. The bomber also had a radar aimed and computer controlled 20mm tail Gatling gun, which had 1200 rounds of ammo. The bomber's standard loadout was a single nuclear weapon loaded inside of an external pod, which was loaded directly under the fuselage. Later, the planes were modified with pylons under the wings to mount B 43 or B 61 nuclear weapons, for a total of five nuclear weapons altogether.
The U.S. Air Force briefly toyed with the idea of using the B-58 for conventional bombing and even a photo recon platform by mounting a camera inside of a pod under the wing. They finally decided to never go through with any of this and the plane was only fielded as a nuclear strike bomber. The plane first flew on November 11, 1956 and went through an extended trial and testing period in which 30 aircraft were basically tested constantly until 1959. Production continued through the early 60s and the final plane was delivered by 1962. Since B-58 pilots were the only pilots in the U.S. Air Force that had experience in sustained, long-distance supersonic flight, many of them were chosen by the CIA to pilot the SR-71 and A-12 ox cart at the inception of the top secret programs. The plane's critical issue and what ultimately killed its service in SAC was its expensive upkeep and its high accident rates. The plane was notoriously expensive. The total cost of the 116 planes was over $3 billion, which is over $20 billion in today's dollars. The plane was also extremely complex for its time and maintenance costs for such a complicated plane were sky high. Over three times as expensive per flight hour as the B-52. Not to mention the time to train crews and maintenance personnel was lengthy and combine that with the fact that of the 116 total planes built, 26 of them were lost in accidents. Needless to say, the bean counters at the Pentagon began eyeballing the B-58. Finally, after the Soviets developed high altitude ground to air missiles, then Defense Secretary Robert McNamara had decided that the B-58 was no longer a viable weapon system. Briefly, the tactics of the B-58 were adjusted to it being a low altitude penetration bomber, but the air density at lower altitudes meant that the bomber couldn't reach supersonic speeds and its range was even more limited. So its speed or altitude were no longer an asset for it, further crippling its usefulness as a weapon system. But even as crippled by its new role as it was, it still excelled at low level penetration compared to other planes. In 1959, the B-58 flew a 1,400-mile sortie from Carswell Air Force Base in Texas to Vandenberg Air Force Base in California at only 100 to 500 feet of elevation the entire flight, never slowing below 690 miles per hour. Even in a situation it was never intended to be put in, the plane still excelled in performance. But there were other factors the Defense Department were making their decisions off of rather than just its raw performance. And unfortunately for the B-58 program, the plane was ordered to be phased out, which began in 1965 and was completed by 1970. Most of the aircraft were sent to mothball at davis Monton Air Force Base in Arizona to await disposal before being scrapped by Southwest Alloys. Only eight B-58 Hustlers survive today. Most of them are on display at various Air Force museums across the United States. A lot of the articles and places I used to do the research for this plane seem to have the opinion that it was some sort of blunder or mistake and uh, should have never been built. Uh, I don't see it that way at all. In fact, I think it was a home run. Um, it was one of the most advanced high performance planes of the Cold War era and the technology that was re required it to be developed and fine tuned in order to build the plane. It, I mean, it far outlived the B-58 itself. Um, it was implemented all across the U.S. Air Force as the planes that were developed and built um, needed that technology. Um, that is why the B-58 was a massive success in my opinion. Not only was it a sexy, hot rod of a plane that the U.S. could taunt the Soviets with, but it was also a technical wonder at the time. It was something that the people liked. I mean, it was sexy. It was fast, it was sleek, it was a big plane, it was shiny, it was just a giant piece of America. And uh, during the darkest days of the Cold War, um, hearing that sonic boom shake the ground brought a smile to a lot of Americans' faces from what I've read. It was, it was like a security in an odd way that I don't think a lot of people nowadays can relate to. Um, I mean, when you're in threat of impending nuclear war at any moment, I mean, you want to have the biggest, the fastest, the, the most awesome in-your-face planes and weapons and stuff, you know? And I think the B-58 was probably, if not the pinnacle, of that like Cold War, shiny plane, sonic boom, atomic era essence that we all think of, then I mean it's pretty damn close. I mean it's it's right there, you know. Well, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'm gonna start putting up more videos. Um, uh, I'm trying to do better quality videos. I know some of my older videos were a little rough, but um, I might actually go back and remake those um, over, make them better. I don't know. Uh, comment let me know what you guys think um, I appreciate all of my new subscribers uh, I hope you're enjoying the channel I'm gonna like I said try to do a little better job on the videos now that I have a little bit more time 
Um, most of those older videos I made when my wife was pregnant, so I was trying to keep like the volume down and stuff. So anyways, thanks guys, appreciate it. Like, comment, subscribe. Peace out. To protect a long-range missile, you bury it 